This is uh, what got me thinking about this was rabbit crap, rabbit crap, rabbit rabbit crap's <laughs> arrests in Florida, and I was wondering where we were at with human trafficking in Vermont. We passed good legislation a few years back um, that made it you know, recognize that. You know, recognize that the women who have been trafficked are victims and not should not be treated as criminal. Yeah. So Michelle with that I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the state of and and we may do a bill or direct Michelle to do we may do some stuff initially in the in a, either a committee bill or a miscellaneous judiciary bill. But I think over the summer, I'd like to have you um, work up a, a bill to update all of our laws regarding um, human trafficking, prostitution, sexual, not, not sexual assault crimes, but sex. Sure. Sexual, those types of sex crimes. Sure. Uh, and then at 10 o'clock, we're going to hear from, I hopefully I'll get to everybody that wanted to speak, but, or that's on the list, but at 10 o'clock, I want to hear from James Dole, who used to be with the Polaris Project, is now with the Human Rights for Kids campaign, and uh, he's, he was helpful to us in drafting the original bills on human rights. Right. So good morning for the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel. And we're just gonna I'm just gonna set the stage a little bit for what we have on the books and for the witnesses that you're gonna talk to this morning, um, looking at our human trafficking laws. So y'all enacted the human trafficking chapter. So you have an entire chapter, chapter 60 in Title 13 on human trafficking. You did that in 2011. Um, I was not the attorney on it, so I don't have uh, really the the um, ex experience about like uh, the process there, but I, in going through the chapter and taking a look at it, I think that there are, you know, there's a, there's two issues there. There's the one about whether or not I think Senator Sears has raised is are we is the state comprehensive enough with regard to covering all the different types of activities, um, uh, and then the other issues. I think there could there's a, some language that's a little seems contradictory or a little unclear that maybe could use some finessing. Um, and so I, I passed out a copy of the chapter for you. Um, so I'll just walk you through real quick so you can kind of see what we have on the books currently. Um, and so, uh, and, and in, I just want to note from this outset, is so this is its own chapter, separate and apart from what you have, um, which is chapter 59, which is lewdness and prostitution. So you have a sub-chapter uh, under 59 that is just relating to prostitution, human trafficking being, being different, and we'll look at the elements of that. Um, so first is section 2651, which is the definition section. Um, I'll just note a couple of the definitions. If you look down on subdivision three, they are commercial sex acts, so it means any sexual act, sexual conduct, or sexually explicit performance on account of any which anything of value is promised to, given to, or received by any person. I, think I just point that out because, um, as Senator Sears noted, I don't know how many years ago, or maybe three or four years ago, Senator Sears, when you worked on this yep. issue and we amended some definitions to kind of kind of close some gaps there around certain activities that were occurring allegedly at some places up in Chittenden County, um, and we're trying to tighten up the language there to make sure that it was broad enough to cover all the activities that you wanted to cover in the human trafficking law. So I think most of us remember that one. So of value would include um, shelter, food, um, if somebody was being yeah, dinner out. Well, I'm thinking like, uh, um, you know, when people are sometimes brought from another country here, and they're they're kept somewhere, and they're told that that they're um, working off their rent or um, so. Another four might cover that bond. That bond. You read four. That's what really where you get into the okay. To the, to the sort of sex slave type of situation. 
Um, I'll also notice, uh, draw your attention to subdivision 7 on labor servitude. So you'll see it tends to track, so when the language on, on what constitutes human trafficking, you'll see it in terms of like sexual activity, or you'll see it in terms of labor servitude. So you have a definition there. If you look at section 2652 for human trafficking, so no person shall knowingly, and I just note, you know, we, we sometimes skip over the the mens rea, the intent piece there, but I just want to identify, I just want to point that out in this context about in terms of whether or not that's required um, uh, uh, intent state is the knowingly with regard to the person's action, defendant's actions. So, I'm sorry, so 2652, section? Page three. Oh, okay. So, right here. Oh, yeah. Yep, so we're getting to the, to the human trafficking crime and the elements there. So the first one is to recruit, entice, harbor, transport provider, obtain by any means a person under the age of 18 for the purpose of having the person engage in a commercial sex act. So this one I, is one of the areas where I, um, again, I don't know why things were done exactly the way that they were, but I'll just note that as one area to maybe to clarify, because then when you have a late, you have a crime in 2653 on aggravated human trafficking, um, the first one that they have on that is, uh, if you basically, if you commit human trafficking and the offense involves a victim who is under the age of 18, and that's the first one under aggravated. So I don't really see any difference between what you have under 2652A1 and 2653A1. Um, but I haven't spoken to anybody in the, in the state's attorney's office or, or the AG's office, and so maybe I'm, I'm missing something there, but I just noticed that that's something maybe we want to take a look at. Um, so A2 is uh, engaging in those activities through force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of having the person engage in the Commercial Sex Act. So that's one of the main differences that you'll see between in human trafficking versus the prostitution chapter is, um, is they're compelling the person through force, fraud, or coercion. Um, so you see in subdivision three, uh, what I just mentioned. Four is benefit financially or by receiving anything of value from participation in a venture, knowing that force, fraud, or coercion will be used to compel a person to engage in the Commercial Sex Act. Subdivision so five is subjecting a person to, to labor servitude. Six is recruiting an enticing person for the purpose of labor servitude. And then seven is benefit financially. So again, you have kind of those two different categories, either sexual servitude or labor servitude. So the penalty that's provided for the uh, lower, I don't know if it's the lower level of human trafficking, but um, uh, is uh, there's no mandatory minimum, but it is up to life in prison. So it's a very substantial penalty. Yeah, that's for the... I mean, I believe that Senator White said there's still some in the Bradbrough area, and I believe somebody else said there's still some in the Burlington area. So there's 14 in the state. 14 in the but state, state which hasn't, you know, obviously hasn't received the attention of law enforcement. Or if it has, they haven't been able to prosecute her. Wasn't that the case with the, the most recent event where they interviewed the women working there and they the women did have their papers, the women said they weren't being mistreated, that they could yeah. leave when they wanted, so they had no case as well. Yeah, uh -huh. I know the Bennington case, they just moved the women quickly. There was no, nobody left because they got away so quickly. I think at that one, though, that I just mentioned, the next day, the people moved. Yeah, they moved quickly. They moved them quickly. Um, so then we have aggravated human trafficking. Um, before you get that, I just want to note, on subsection C, um, this is, and you already mentioned this, this concept in our series, is that a person who's a victim of sex trafficking um, uh, shall not be found in violation of either the lewdness and prostitution chapter or the obscenity chapter. So again, you know, ensuring that while well, somebody who is uh, being either forced to engage in a commercial sex act or being trafficked, that they then can't be charged with prostitution or lewdness or obscenity. Um, and then the, and then again, this is an area that I think really needs to be tweaked and taken a look at because I think the language in C1A and C1B uh, is a little confusing to me with regard to uh, the under 18 folks. So I just kind of mentioned that as something for us to come back to and I'll speak with the state's attorneys and, and the yeah. AG's office about that. Um, 
I also want to note that on C2 um, provides for an affirmative defense. So if you have someone who is a victim of sex trafficking and they're being charged with uh, a crime other than something that's lewdness, prostitution, or obscenity, so perhaps um, they're being charged with, um, with sale of drugs, um, that they can raise as an affirmative defense the fact that that person committed that act um, as a result of their force or, 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 du or under duress um, by, a, um, um, by a sex trafficker. So section 2653 is aggravated human trafficking. So the penalty for this is uh, 20 years to life. So there is a mandatory, one of your few mandatory minimums that you have. Um, subsection A sets forth the elements there. Um, and so it eventually says if, if somebody commits the crime under 2652 and then under A1, uh, the offense involves a child under the age of 18. If the person has a previous conviction for human trafficking, um, if the victim of human trafficking suffers serious bodily injury or death, um, and then if the actor commits the crime of human trafficking under circumstances that constitutes other sexual crimes. And so you see the penalty on subsection B, as I mentioned, 20 years to life. Um, 2654, is this is patronizing or facilitating human trafficking? Um, I'm sorry. Michelle, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, before you move on. So the fine for um, 2652 mm -hmm. is... Yes, um, I, I did notice that. I, I, I don't know why. What? That doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what The fine for 2652 is 500,000 max, and then on aggravated, it's 100,000 max. Yeah, I don't know why that would be. Yep. Yeah, I've got it. No, yeah, there's a, just a few little things that are, are kind of uh, didn't make sense to me in here. So um, we can go back. We can maybe pull the, file, the 2011 file and see if it's uh, if we understand. But um, I maybe talked to Eric way. about it. Eric was counsel, but it was a, 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 a clerk who had done the bill. And so I think maybe, you know, so neither one of us, unfortunately, have a lot of historical okay. memory about why things are the way that they are on this one. Um, so 2654, uh, as I mentioned, patronizing and facilitating human trafficking. So this is where you have, let's say you have a, um, a motel owner and, um, and someone is running an a human trafficking operation and having people come and go and the motel owner um, uh, knowingly is allowing that to go on in their place of business um, that would fit under 2654. 2655 is solicitation, so again, no person shall knowingly solicit a commercial sex act from a victim of human trafficking. Um, that penalty there is a five-year felony. Can I ask, in terms of the knowingly, they have to know that they're soliciting a commercial sex act, and they have to know that they're soliciting that sex act from a victim of human trafficking? Yes. Okay. Um, so 2656, and I think, did you have somebody on your witness list? I don't think this morning from the AG's office, or? Yep. Um, I, no, the AG is next week, I think. Okay. Um, and this is, so. We're going to have, we're going to come back to this next week. Okay. Um, so this is if a, if a business um, uh, is convicted of violating the chapter, AG can commence a proceeding in civil division to dissolve the business um, under our corporation's law. 2657 is a provision for restitution um, for victims of human trafficking. 2658 uh, is a prostitution conviction, so you can do a motion to vacate. Um, so it's uh, a process, you know, some What would be helpful is to the, what's the crime of prostitution in the state? Uh, what's the, the penalty? Uh, for the, the, for the um, person who is prostituting him or herself. Um, not more than one year. So. Uh, for second or subsequent, it's not more than three years. 
Um, so again, this is one thing that we want to take a look at and see if that's really if it's how it's working with, with the evolution of your expungement laws. Yeah. And I know that looking um, at um, we had discussed just a little bit about Polaris project and looking at seeing what other thing what other proposals are, are out there for for best practices for the states with regard to to. Well, we do have the expungement bill coming over right. from the house where we could uh, add to that. I believe it passed yesterday. Or Right. But I did see that one of the things the Polaris Project is, is advocating for is kind of having some specific language with regard to uh, ex expungement and criminal history record uh, issues with regard to for victims. victims. For victims, right. yeah. For, for, no, for the victims. Okay. Yeah. So 2654 is patronizing. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that because if you – that's the case in Florida where they're, they're saying, well, they didn't know it was human trafficking. Uh, Are you talking you? about the clients? Or yeah, talking, the clients. Right. That would be actually 2650, uh, 2655 solicitation. Okay. Um, so... Uh, how do you... I'd be interested to know how... Prosecutor would prove they knowingly did it. All of the crimes in Florida are misdemeanors based upon them not knowing it was human trafficking. But then, if you knew anything about human trafficking, you would know that it was human trafficking. How would, how would you know? Well, if everybody, if how would you know? If if no, this would be very prejudiced, but if no one spoke English, I think well, I, th I think it would be the fact that, you know, you read it on, I think, how you find out about these are websites you go to and you get comments from people. We'll hear testimony on that, but that's a good question. How would you know? But I think you, an educated person, might guess that they... In the Kraft case in Florida, they were saying that the, the, not the clients, but the um, investigators knew, yeah. or they pretend they knew because they could see evidence that they were sleeping there and right. eating there. Yeah. But I, I would think that's even tough to prove in court because, um, you know, there are plenty of places where people own a restaurant and they sleep and eat there. Well, the guards, of, I understand, the correctional, whatever they are, workers, yeah. the counselors at Woodside lived there yeah. in small rooms, they told me. So they're broom closets that they have to stay in. Maybe we should investigate that, Joe. Right. <laughs> Seems like an institution. Joe's out there for a tour. All for it. <laughs> uh, anyway, all right. So. so that's what I've got for you this morning. I'll stick around, listen to the witnesses, take notes, see. Um, I think yeah, the two things that we would like to you covered. I think a lot. Of the, in the agent's office at the time, uh, I remember John Tribble was very involved in working with this committee on on the on the legislation, and we did revisit it a few years ago when we realized that happy endings weren't a part of the original 2011 law, and um, and so it, it, it may be that it is fairly comprehensive. I do know that there are some other. There's a bill in the House right now um, that is requiring. Um, some uh, notices in certain places with regard to um, uh, that, that information. That didn't go anywhere, I don't think. No, it didn't. And, and also training for people in certain types but of fields. I think that's one of James's suggestions, though, is there be is an it? education campaign. Okay. <coughs> um, not education, well, I guess it could be in school, but not education, edu not education, not public. It was on, it, it specifically to, to to say how do you how do you identify how yeah. do you just, so if you are a so I think the bill talks and uh, talks about like if uh, if you're in the service industry or if, uh, that you might be more likely to encounter that type of activity yeah. what are the signs what would you what would you look for mm -hmm. um, so okay thank you Michelle Thanks. our okay. first witness is Beth um, Matney. Thank you.
Vermont Police Association. Beth, we're, we're looking more for an update on human trafficking today, not but if there are suggestions for a legislative change, we're happy to hear. So, um, Elizabeth Novotny for the Vermont Police Association. Thank you, Senator Sears and the committee for opening up a discussion on this. So, uh, I hope to have Commander Prouty here the next time you continue the discussion. He's a member of the Vermont Police Association and is also a member of the Human Trafficking Commission. So he can, he can get a into the weeds with you a little bit on, on this, um, uh, in this area. But I just want to in broad brush, raise a couple of, of issues for you. So these are very difficult cases to prove, and you've hit the nail on the head. And they're complicated, and they are labor intensive. I mean, I think uh, uh, Detective Burnham is here, and he's going to speak to that. But they are labor intensive and resource intensive, and it. Um, you will typically have victims who are engaged in prostitution. And for a variety of reasons, they may be drug dependent. That may also be uh, a factor, and often is. And so unraveling that and being able to uh, prove what you suspect requires the cooperation of this person, these victims, who are dependent entirely upon these people who are trafficking them. So when you consider whether to how to, how to treat the crime of prostitution, um, I think it's important to talk to the investigators and the prosecutors a little bit more and explore that a little bit more. Particularly if you're going to consider expungement of criminal history records. So there's a difference between the actual conviction itself, the fact that you've been convicted of prostitution, right? The actual court record that says conviction, and a criminal history record. The criminal history record is defined in um, uh, was it Title 20? Yeah. And it is everything. Everything that's associated with that person is their criminal history record. So if that person is a victim in a human trafficking case, and we're trying to uh, uh, correctly uh, right the wrong and uh, take away that prostitution conviction, you need to be very careful that you don't um, have an unintentional consequence of eliminating the actual human trafficking um, case files that, that involve that particular person. So that's- I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So it's just something to pay attention to think, as you- And I haven't read the House bill yet, but I thought that it took care of that problem. The court last year, I believe the court saw it as eliminating the entire case record. We saw it as expunging the crime. And so they hired four extra, in the Budget Adjustment Act, there's money for four extra people to do the current expungement. And that's because they wanted to go through everything. You know? And I hope, hopefully, the House fixed that. If they didn't, we need to do that in here. Yep. But that, that's for everything, whether you, um, whether it's human trafficking or um, possession of marijuana. It was never our intent that the court needed to go through the whole record, given that the public, given that probably if it was a any kind of profile case, there was a news story or whatever that you can't get rid of anyway. Yeah, well, the police association strongly supports that that you that you take that. Well, into anyway, that should so. come up in the expungement bill, but I don't know if the house did it or didn't do it. So thank you, by the way, for recognizing it. And it's, it's actually the use of the term criminal history record, and that's right. why there was not so much confusion, but it actually has meaning in statutes, and right. people were just following the statute. So it's great that people are focusing on that. So I think those are the two things to keep your eye on the ball, uh, which would be prostitution, which is typically the inroad to proving these cases, and um, the, um, the expungement of criminal history records versus uh, expunging the actual fact of conviction. And other than that, I wouldn't leave it to Commander Prouty to talk to you about um, some other specific suggestions. I know that there are discussions ongoing with the current grant that, that's come through that I think Chris Fenno is going to speak about today. That, you know, that, that the, because these are difficult, you, 
you know, you have to come at it in a sort of QZ type approach as opposed to when you have these sexual um, uh, investigation units. It's a unit approach with prosecutors who are assigned and uh, skilled in these cases uh, is probably the best practice. And I know that it's already, <coughs> and it's going to be bolstered with this grant. So Maybe that's I should true. have asked Michelle this question, but I guess I'll ask this to anybody to answer it. Are our laws that much different? Florida in terms of human trafficking? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't taken because a look at Florida. If, yeah, if they're, um, they were able to get a search warrant to, as you know, have cameras inside the facility. And clearly they believe that it was human trafficking, so I'm assuming they have the proof to that. Yeah. But then they're saying that the clients didn't know it was human trafficking, so therefore they're being charged with <coughs> soliciting prostitution. And so uh, I don't know if our laws would allow that type of search warrant to put cameras in there, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what, how our laws are similar or divergent from Florida. So a couple other suggestions to explore, to explore. One is a registry for, for employers who also are landlords, presumably, have that relationship with their, with their employees. Sometimes that's perfectly acceptable. It might be the ski industry has a, uh, a place for their ski workers, and it may be completely appropriate and fine. And, but in, in human trafficking, it's a, often a red flag, so it allows the state to know which employers are also housing their employees, uh, and 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 so that's a, a consideration. But it's, uh, it's not just sex acts; it's uh, servitude of mm -hmm. yeah. you know labor or households. Right, and um, yeah. I was just wondering in the Florida case, it seemed as though they were attempting to deny that they had been living there, even though signs were seen. So. Would the registry speak to the people we're really trying to focus on, or would it capture mostly the, as you said, the legal businesses that are? Well, what it allows for is an opportunity for law enforcement if they suspect that you're an owner of a business and your employees are living there and you're not on the registry. It gives them an, an inroad into the building. If they can't quite show human trafficking and a probable cause for that. They have probable cause for something else. That gets them into exposure. You have a memo or something from Michelle on changes you'd like to see. I I I don't, and I'd be happy to put one together. Well, it's, it's as long as she, she's not here right now, yep. I'd like her. Be happy to what? do that. She said she'd be back. With her yeah, friends. I know, but I wanted to make um, Beth make Michelle aware. If I don't remember. And the other and last piece is um, licensing of massage therapists or some sort of licensing. Huh. Didn't we do that? So, no, <clears throat> we did not do that because um, they there wasn't a human trafficking issue at the time that they did the, um, or they didn't recognize it at the time they did the sunrise, and there wasn't harm shown. In order to license somebody in the state of Vermont, you have to show that there's actual harm done to the public by not licensing, and that's the way our licensing law works. But now, <clears throat> I've had uh, conversations with a couple um, different massage therapists, and there's also now some harm done to massage therapists from clients. So there, there's more pressure to, to do um, that. So we'll take it up again. Well, I always wonder why my barber has to be licensed. Is that because he's got a razor? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and chemicals. chemicals. And <clears throat> hairspray. No, permanent things like permanent. I use all of my. I don't know. I just. Love you know, just <laughs> but anyway, we will. We're okay. going to. I appreciate it. it. We're look well, at it that's something that government operations <laughs> right. may look at as yeah. registering the yeah. and, and then the last yeah. piece you'll get from, I hope, I hope from the people on the Human uh, Trafficking uh, Commission. And maybe some of that grant money is going to go to this. But it's once you suspect you have a human trafficking case, you have victims that are extraordinarily needy, and their needs are immediate. They need treatment immediately. They need housing immediately. There's, you know, if we're if we're going to make an inroad into the case itself or into their care, that that is an immediate need. I don't have an answer for you. I just want to put that on the map for you to consider I know in your discussions. Problems. 
when we first started talking about this in many of these cases was the victims of human trafficking were unable to speak English and the police departments did not have translators to help them. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are my three okay. quick thoughts and thank you very thank much you for Beth. the discussion. Thank you. Um, you're replacing mm -hmm. Colonel Birmingham, which is fine. Yes, sir. Join the police. <clears throat> You're obviously not a I am certainly not the colonel. <laughs> um, good morning. My name is uh, Lieutenant Lance Burnham. I am. Uh, I have um, have the privilege, and I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but I've investigated a number of these cases. I'm also an active steering committee member of the Vermont Human Trafficking Task Force, and I'd really like to talk about that today because we have done a tremendous amount of work when it comes to um, human trafficking. And I think sometimes the amount of work that we do isn't necessarily getting noticed out there. And I really want to talk about that, and I can certainly answer questions about some of the training that we have provided to, quite frankly, thousands of Vermonters and professionals throughout the state regarding this specific uh, crime. But just to back up a little bit, in 2013, the United States uh, Attorney G Attorney's Office of you know, the District of Vermont as well as the Vermont Attorney General's Office, reconstituted a group of members, a lot of stakeholders throughout the state of Vermont, and formed the Vermont Human Trafficking Task Force. Currently, members of the Human Trafficking Task Force uh, involve the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Vermont Attorney General's Office, uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security Investigations, Vermont State Police, uh, Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, Give Way to Freedom, as well as a lot of number of other stakeholders throughout the state of Vermont. We meet monthly. Uh, we have subdivisions that specialize in certain areas, such as training, law enforcement, community outreach, um, as well as a very robust training division that is actually going throughout the state, providing certain much needed training, uh, as well as uh, attorneys that sit on the, the, the task force to keep us up to date on certain cases that are actually in front of judicial process right now. We, as far as training goes, as of today, we have uh, trained at a minimum of about 2,600 Vermonters across the state, across throughout the systems throughout the state, which would include law enforcement, uh, judges, prosecutors, uh, the Department of Health, the Department of Social Services, um, regarding uh, everything that has to do with human trafficking. Several smaller projects over the past several years, one of the most significant being the task force rule uh, assisting DCF uh, to develop policy and procedure as well as an infrastructure uh, to designate a point person for all juvenile human trafficking investigations. This effort has yielded tremendous progress in the state's ability to track, intervene, and prevent juvenile sexual exploitation as well as labor trafficking. We have also produced and disseminated a statewide PSA uh, and sponsored a mural creation in Burlington, which you may have seen on, on the news. Mural? A mural, oh, yes. Okay, it's the you. giveaway to freedom um, in down point, downtown uh, Burlington. We've also, in the, as with the state of Vermont, we've uh, created, created and dedicated a hotline that anybody can call 24-7 to, to either if they've witnessed human trafficking or if they feel that they have witnessed human trafficking or more importantly, if they are a, a victim of human trafficking, they have a resource to call. Last year, um, the General Assembly adopted Act 140, an act related to human trafficking, which concerned child custody issues that can arise when sex trafficking survivors and children have resulted from their victimization. This year, the the Center for Crime Victim Services, as well as the Vermont State Police, in collaboration with the Human Trafficking Task Force, were awarded $1.2 million um, and a DOJ collaborative agreement uh, for this year, fiscal year 2018, which will expire in 2021. The purpose of this is to, again, um, allow us to provide victim services to victims, it allows us to provide training to our law enforcement officers. Uh, it also allows us to, to provide trainings throughout the entire state of Vermont. 
and giving us the ability to actually go that. And the, re the purpose of it, it, we would like to eventually form a task force. We are well on our way of doing that. Uh, I personally am overseeing that process. We are trying to identify on the Vermont State Police side uh, specifically, uh, identify detectives on each four corners of the state, provide them for the most advanced training in human trafficking, so that way when a case comes in, we have a detective that's ready to go. If a case comes in, and, it, and as I said, as Beth uh, said, these are very uh, robust and very difficult cases. One person cannot do them. Uh, we need a team effort in this, and we understand that. Having this task force model will allow us to pull our resources um, and put them where they need to be. Uh, this is not just the Vermont State Police. That's why it's very important that we collaborate with our federal partners, uh, the FBI. Uh, Homeland Security has been tremendous in this, um, and they have provided um, detectives as well, especially with the ongoing uh, investigations that we do have currently. I will say uh, in the state of Vermont, we are extremely lucky. We do not have um, any walls with our federal partners in law enforcement. We work very well together, uh, and that is not the case in every state. Um, I have gone to many trainings where the law enforcement has a tendency to headbutt, and I've gone throughout the country. Um, and I'm very proud of Vermont that we just don't have that. I know I can call up our resident agent and say, hey, this is Lance, I need help, and I'm gonna get it immediately. Um, so we are very lucky with that. We also have a very strong working relationship with our victim services partners. Um, I've worked with um, the crime victim services on many cases, uh, even outside of human trafficking, that I think we are well on our way of really becoming a model for other states to actually follow. Um, it is very difficult case. These are very difficult cases. Um, the reality is, on the law enforcement side, they don't ever have to come to us. The victim may not ever get to the point where we charge criminal cases, and we're fine with that. If we have a victim that we take out of that lifestyle, provide them with the services that they need, we win. It's a win. It doesn't matter if a criminal investigation has actually happened or not. Do we have a long ways to go? Yes, we certainly do. Um, but I do feel that our, our laws, as they're written right now, are strong. They mirror the federal law, which helps us because we have, again, have a very strong working relationship with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, but that's where we are right now. Uh, the Human Trafficking Task Force, we have invited. Uh, we know that there have been um, human trafficking laws that have been presented this year, um, which we have not supported. We don't like, don't agree with how they were particularly written. Uh, we invite you to one of our meetings. Please come and see what we're doing, and I think that will open up a lot of us. Can I ask, um, when you say you don't support those bills or the way they were written, mm -hmm. can, you, can you give me any? I think the, the way the bill was written this year regarding the awareness of uh, training and providing that, uh, the issue that I would not support is that it provided that and gave sole discretion and gave that burden onto the Department of Health. I see. We've already had that established. It doesn't need to go there. We're providing that training already. Um, we're doing it. I think to have the Department of Health come in and reinvent the wheel doesn't make any sense. Uh, we also have concerns about the postings of flyers in local restaurants and bars regarding human trafficking. I think that's not the Vermont style. Um, I think if you have, as an example, if you have a female that's just sitting at a bar by herself and there's a poster right behind her saying, this is what human trafficking looks like, that's, that's not necessary. Um, I would back um, Ms. Novotny's um, decisions on things to consider about licensing massage parlors. Uh, in the state of Vermont, we have had three cases in the Chittenden County area of massage parlors that we have shut down. Um, and again, yes, our victims did not speak English. They were very difficult. Uh, but again, we looked at it as a law enforcement side. We took those victims out of their, out of their surroundings. 
and we win. We did not get prosecutions out of it, but we're okay with that. Um, but we do, we, at the same token, we also have a number of cases that are in front of uh, uh, the judicial process now for human trafficking. You do? We do. I, I, I have not read anything about any of that. I think that's because they're in the federal system at this point. Oh, they're on the federal? Yes. I don't, I can't speak for every county. Uh, I, there could be uh, charges out there that I'm just not aware of. I, I do know the cases that I'm that I've been either involved in or um, have had discussions with. If there are cases, in the, uh, without divulging any ongoing investigation or anything, you know, it take. Mm -hmm. um, are most of them sex cases, or are there labor cases as well? Uh, I would say that we are seeing a higher rise, and I think you can back me on this, is uh, sex and uh, an opioid addiction problem. What? Uh, the opioid addiction and the sex leading crime, to the leading sexual to the sex crime. exploitation. Uh, I think what we are also seeing is that we know that some of our runaway juveniles are being mm -hmm. exploited. They're being taken out of the state of Vermont. They're being addicted to um, opioids, and they're being used in the sex trade. And then they return back to Vermont. And we are seeing disclosures that that is happening. Uh, we are actively working with that. Uh, I can say that prior to this position that I'm in now, uh, I oversaw uh, our detective bureau in the northwest corner of Vermont, and it changed the process of how we respond to runaway juveniles. We don't just take a phone call anymore. And if a juvenile is returned, uh, we better have a detective talking to that juvenile immediately. Where did you go? What happened? Because you don't just run away. Tell us why this happened. So I think we've, we've seen changes, and, um, and I think we're going to see results of that. Other questions? Anything else you want to uh, the one thing I do want to say is uh, we know that these victims need services. Uh, the Human Trafficking Task Force is working um, on housing relationships, specifically in Chittenden County. We are working with the mayor to uh, develop some sort of housing in the Burlington area. Um, but um, you know, the, the work that we have done through the tra task force I think is great. Um, we probably have not done a great salesman's job. We're doing the job, but we're not selling. We're not telling people about it. And, that is our next step. So, uh, yeah, I think it's important that we that we do some kind of <coughs> notice. <coughs> um, when when you do have these cases, you work directly with your federal partners rather than having it done by local police or is it all? Is it, I mean. I guess, so they're not coming under Vermont laws, is that correct? I think, um, I mean, I'm trying to understand whose law, is it the federal law that is, pro that if the federal prosecutor is prosecuting the case, that it's under federal law, am I correct? Or is it under yes. Vermont law? Yes. So we're not using Vermont's laws, and I'm curious, and you don't have to answer this today, maybe you want to do some research on it. but. I think the committee would be curious about if there's deficiencies in Vermont, current Vermont law that, force, that forces you to the feds, or is it because the feds have more resources? I, I think I can answer that through experience. I don't think that, uh, I think Vermont law is very strong. Um, could there be some changes that, I, I think if there are changes, they need to be very minor ones. Uh, I think that we, as I said earlier, we mirror the federal law uh, very closely, which is helpful. I think the majority of the reasons that we are on the federal side uh, at this point is because there, there are larger scale drug investigations that have started on the federal side. And But I do think that the more we train our, our Vermont Drug Task Force to identify uh, potential human traffickings, we will see um, crimes on the, on the state side. I also do know that we do initially charge human trafficking cases, but they get pled out. Uh, as soon as you have a drug offender uh, that knows that they have the, they're going to serve 25 years minimum or potentially life in jail, it's very, it's a very good golden ring to say, yeah, I'll plead to five years for a drug charge any day. So, um, 
but but I I, I firmly feel that Vermont uh, human trafficking law is very well written, and we need to if we do make modifications, it has to be done. I don't think. Go ahead. I just was going to ask you the bill <clears throat> that you um, didn't like. Did it pass the House? Didn't support. I wouldn't say I didn't like it. You didn't, <laughs> didn't support. support. <laughs> didn't support. <laughs> Did it pass the House? I don't believe so. I don't okay. Think. No, it, it hasn't, and I, I don't think it got taken up. It okay. Was introduced by Representative Sullivan, of course. And but I believe James Gold has suggested okay. that a more in line of um, having it through the education department and teaching, particularly kids, the dangers of human trafficking. If they get involved in running away, they run a lot. I have provided training, and I know that's a touchy subject, and I, I don't mean to take up any time of the other witnesses. Uh, I have provided training to, to high schoolers regarding this subject. Um, I know it's a touchy subject with teachers as well as the Department of Education um, because they don't want to either shock or they don't want to concern children. Children know about this. And I, quite frankly, I have taught blood spatter investigations to children on homicide scenes, and they take it. This is not a, this is not a, a scene that they know. Can we ask for quiet out there? Without my being called wrong. I went out once in GovOps and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did too, and then I got I got called wrong, and you probably got called wrong. No, no, I didn't get called anything. They just started singing instead. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll take this up again next week. Um, I don't know what day we and I need to work on our agenda, but uh, whenever we, uh, we do, we, we hope to get more suggestions of whether there's tweaks in Vermont law, and as Michelle said, it's something for next year, but there's also issues, things we can do right away. So, Chris, if you join us, please. Chris, before you start, I'm going to say that at a quarter to 10, I have to <laughs> meet with one of the governor's people for about 10 minutes. So I'll, okay. I'll be leaving, but it's not because I'm of what you're saying. excited that you get to meet with the governor? I'll be quick. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be excited for it. <laughs> for the record, uh, Chris Fenno, Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. I want to thank you, Senator Sears, and this committee for bringing attention and awareness to the issue um, of human trafficking in Vermont. The center works to address victim service needs of trafficking survivors in several ways. We've awarded, uh, we, we have been awarded um, this grant in conjunction with the Vermont State Police. We also have used federal Victims of Crime Act monies to begin direct services first rolled out in Burlington. We, when we originally wrote the grant um, last spring, we had included extending that and getting a caseworker um, in the Rutland area. Uh, but at one of the task force meetings, it became clear that we didn't know if we were gonna get the grant and that things in the Rutland area were, um, were such that we needed to act sooner than later. So we actually, um, where we were gonna spend half of that money and have the grant pay the other half, we decided to roll it out um, for Rutland right away. So I believe they have hired um, and are getting trained by the case manager uh, up in Burlington. Um, she was trying, spending all of her time sort of traveling the state. <laughs> we only have one person. Uh, the Victims' Compensation Program uh, provides limited funds to support survivors' basic needs. And, um, and as uh, was said, that we are active members of the Vermont Human Trafficking Task Force, and our training and community outreach director serves on the task force training and outreach subcommittee, supporting dozens of trainings over the years. We also advocate for victim-centered, trauma-informed laws and procedures, such as Act um, 140 that was adopted last year. The scope of human trafficking in Vermont, unfortunately, um, is hard to kind of put a number on. 
uh, demographics and geography can easily support and hide both sex and labor trafficking. Uh, and I would speak, Senator Sears, to say labor trafficking is really underground in this state. It does happen, um, but it's, it's not sort of confined to cities or places where people could notice. It's not necessarily, necessarily in the scheme. Right, right. But rather something associated with maybe a restaurant. In right, it could be a restaurant, could be a farm, could be, you know, all kinds of things. Um, we also have recognized that the opioid, opioid uh, epidemic, rural isolation, <coughs> the ease of travel to large metropolitan areas, and agriculture and hospitality industries are all known factors that contribute to trafficking. Uh, a recent data collection completed by the Vermont Human Trafficking Task Force reported that Vermont's governmental and victim service agencies encountered at least 250 trafficking victims from 2014 through mid-2017. Of the yeah, of the 112 victims uh, for whom uh, nationality could be asserted, 11 of those 112 were foreign nationals. Within months of the South Burlington Police Department's human trafficking case manager taking on new cases, within months she had 25 trafficking survivors on her roster for services. That and. It really was, it's one of those things, that, you know, if you build it, they will come. If you're not offering services, then you are giving no outlet for possible intervention and changes. Education, I totally believe in it. And in fact, uh, a lot of this grant, which we're doing with the state police, are going to be training allied professionals to understand and to look for trafficking victims, not in a in a way that you know you're sus you're suspect of everyone, and not necessarily like they do with domestic violence. Ask at hospitals, are you safe in your home? But to do training so people can recognize signs that it's happening, um, that dentists and hairdressers and you know across the board, pediatricians, everybody has basic information and a place to do a referral should that be necessary. We have a long way to come in terms of um, bolstering uh, services. Part of what we're going to be doing uh, through this new grant is really working with the network um, on the network of domestic violence and sexual assault programs to uh, ensure that, that they are on their end, and they are now, but, but to support their efforts to identify victims that may, they may be coming into contact with. Um, the task force stakeholders and partners have presented to at least 2,600 Vermonters across the various systems, targeting a wide array of uh, audiences. The, the subcommittee for this group has worked to tailor uh, their presentations to <coughs> nonprofits or the health community, law enforcement, um, and we're going to build on that with the with the grant money. Um, our training director is written into the grant as match, um, so that she can work with. Uh, she's already on the task force subcommittee, but so that she can really work and identify and put together effective trainings and um, and get those out to the public. Uh, the task force has spearheaded several small projects over the last several years. One of the most significant being the task force role in, as was say, stated, assisting DCF to develop policy, procedures, infrastructure, and a designated point person for all ju juvenile human trafficking investigations. The effort has yielded tremendous progress in the state's ability to track, intervene, and present juvenile sexual, uh, prevent juvenile sexual exploitation and labor trafficking. We have also, through the Vermont Human Trafficking Task Force, produced and disseminated a statewide PSA and sponsored the mural. What's the age? Do you have those figures from 2000, you said from 2014 to 2017? 
Is it broken down by age? I didn't mean to break into your time. No, no, that's fine. I, I don't it have it, but I have it. I for it. It would be helpful for us as we go further on this. I think James Stoll's emphasis will be on children. And when you said that, what's st still striking me, and I'm sorry I haven't been listening to some of your other testimonies, because my focus has been on the fact that you build it, they will come. If you don't have the services, they're not going to admit that they're human trafficked, blah, blah, blah. And I'm wondering how many are under 25, uh, under 20, under 18, who would be under DCF. And the, the law seems to indicate that they would automatically be considered a child in need of care and supervision, which would get them services. And if it's the older people, but if you, if you had 25 in Burlington, Maybe there's two in Bennington, two in St. Johnsbury, and five in Brattleboro, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, maybe Rutland is a hotbed and might have more than 25. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I'm no, sorry I can, for no, I can look focusing for the on something else, but it's, it struck me as 200 plus people, and then, um, did you say 25 of them foreign nationals? Yeah, uh, no, it was a small Eleven. amount. 11. 11 were foreign nationals. So it's not as high as one would expect. It's really not. And part is that because they move so much? There is a lot of movement. Um, but the other thing is that it is really underground. And so if people aren't looking for it or aware of it or noticing it, um, yeah. it goes undetected. Yeah, she, she, um, yeah that, that's, that, that was what we found when we were looking at the facade piles we first when we did the update um, was the, 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 the skill of particularly the Asian massage followers, which is what was in Florida, the skill of the owners to move people from parlor to parlor in order to avoid detection. And that does happen a lot um, of crossing state lines, uh, especially in sex trafficking, of moving people and moving Vermonters out of Vermont, especially youth. Um, and I, I know that the police have, and law enforcement have been dealing with that. Um, so the good news, and it really is actually fantastic news, is that I think with the task force, the Vermont task force, receiving this grant, uh, it's really going to enable the law enforcement and nonprofit and other community members to gain awareness and the one thing that we're looking at at the center is to say, okay, where, where should services be beefed up? Is it a matter of, um, and trying to be cost effective around it, but trying to say, you know, is it a matter of the network programs um, not only improving or adding on to their training, but actively uh, providing services and what would that look like and how would they respond? Um, to saying where else in the state is there this need for services? If there aren't services, and I can't say this enough, there's it's not going to go anywhere. People will identify it, but it's not it's not going to happen. The other thing, because I heard the questions about the feds, uh, the federal government being involved, the U.S. Attorney's Office also does have resources for victims, and so that often can be a, a good supplement um, and really does augment the ability to provide services. Um, I'm just, I didn't think we had many cases because they don't, why is it somebody wounding somebody and the, makes the press but somebody the victim of human trafficking well, I know that get there. I was recently talking with the case manager out of South Burlington Police Department, and out of her caseload, the number that are uh, involved with the justice system are very small. They're not ready to do it. They're not able to do it yet. Um, so a lot of the caseload are people who have been trafficked, are being trafficked, and for whatever reason have not chosen to go into the justice system to try to do that. The nice thing is that both of those case manager positions 
are based out of law enforcement agencies. And so they have, the workers have developed a real camaraderie with officers. They trade lots of information. They, uh, they are the eyes and ears sometimes on the street for what is happening and are able to get input from law enforcement about maybe where, where somebody has been taken or uh, reaching out to them. So it, it's an interesting um, combination. Well, sometimes people are charged with sexual assault. It's really a human trafficking case. They plead to that, but maybe they're charged with it in the first place because it's hard to prove the human trafficking elements. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, thank you all. I think thank it's you, great that you are shining the spotlight on that. Well, we hope to, uh, I don't think it's going to be just a, uh, it's going to be more than just, um, there may be some things we feel we need to do this year, either in the miscellaneous judiciary bill or in the, um, expungement bill. And what you missed when you were out and I asked Beth Novotny to get back to you on it was she was talking about the expungement to make sure you keep the case record that you can expunge the crime of the victim, mm -hmm. but if you expunge the case record, you could lose the case against whoever was the trafficker. <coughs> That's what she said. You mean like if it's mm -hmm. if it case has, history it hasn't been case history file, yeah. Or your charges haven't been brought against the trafficker. So I, you, she'll get you some okay. information. And uh, Lance pulled up the pie chart of, um, of ages. And oh, good. I'm hoping you can read those little no, comments. Feel free to read that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and these are these are old numbers. And again, for the record, it's Lieutenant Broom. Uh, from the year 2014 through to 2017, 80% of our victims uh, were between the ages of 13 and 29. Within that group, 40% uh, were 13 and 19, and 40% were uh, 20 to 29. 93% of those victims were female, 7% were male. Thank you. Very helpful. But I can actually send you all some follow up information that we have there. Um, any other questions for Chris? Chris, thank you. Um, can you, can you see if we can get James Dole on one of these phones? Sure. I don't know if we've updated our other, our that phone. Yet. They told me it was fixed, so I hear I have questions that's for him to help with that. We'd like to get done by 20 past 10, so I'll ask James to. <coughs> we have two members of the judicial attention. Dick Sears and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee and a number of other people uh, in the room on the subject of human trafficking and so glad to be talking with you again. Um, and uh, I noticed, when, well we're friends on Facebook so I see you're traveling the entire United States these days. That is correct, I'm sorry to so many your voice sir. And it's uh, so great to be able to testify before your committee this morning. Well, we appreciate that. And uh, you're now working on human rights for kids. Maybe you can give us a short description of that and maybe get into your testimony. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, members of the committee, my name is James Dole, uh, for the record. 
I am the founder and president of Human Rights for Kids, which is a child's rights organization based in Washington, D.C. We are really dedicated to the promotion and protection of the human rights, uh, of human rights for children across the United States. And one of the things that we are trying to do uh, nationally is to raise uh, the profile of the link between adverse childhood experiences and early childhood trauma to negative life outcomes in every sector that comes into contact uh, with children. So looking at uh, this issue through a human rights lens within the educational system, within the juvenile justice system, but really within every system that comes into contact so that people understand uh, the negative, uh, negative outcomes that are oftentimes associated in children's life when we fail to either prevent or protect children from harm or we fail to mitigate uh, uh, that harm when they do experience it. And then against that backdrop, we also specifically work on policy proposals to protect children's human rights. And that's uh, really where uh, our work has been focused uh, this, uh, this year and, and will be focused over the next several years. And so one of the things that I thought that I might start out by doing is highlighting some of the um, policy issues that are coming up both nationally and in the states that are relatively new and unique, particularly as it relates to human trafficking. And uh, so there's a number of things that uh, have come up uh, in, the, in recent weeks and, and months and years uh, related to trafficking that uh, haven't really been on people's profile before. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is a unique and innovative issue area uh, known as Sarah's Law. Uh, Sarah's Law uh, really was inspired by a young woman by the name of Sarah Cruzan. And some people might have heard of her case, and uh, she is very similar to another young woman who just had her sentence commuted uh, by Governor Haslam of Tennessee, uh, Centoya Brown. Uh, Centoya Brown was a child sex trafficking victim who, uh, at the age of 16, uh, was picked up by a John who had been soliciting her uh, for sex and ended up, uh, Centoya ended up um, killing him. And she got uh, basically a life. Uh, was basically a life without parole sentence. Her sentence was life with the possibility of parole after 50 years, um, and uh, and was going to die in prison essentially until Governor Haslam intervened. Uh, there's another young girl by the name of Alexis Martin, who's currently serving a life with parole sentence for having killed her trafficker when she was just a 15 year old girl. And then of course in the case of Sarah Cruzan. Uh, who, the, who these laws have been named after, uh, Sarah had her sentence commuted uh, for having killed her violent pimp in 1994 uh, by Governor uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I want to provide a little bit more context to uh, Sarah's uh, particular case because I think it highlights a lot of what child sex trafficking victims uh, have, have gone through in their lives. And Sarah's case was uh, she was poor, um, she was, um, you know, like a lot of these girls had experienced earlier childhood trauma, including uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and neglect in her household. Her father was in prison uh, while she was growing up. And these things made her particularly vulnerable to the human trafficker coming along and beginning to groom her and exploit her later on. And in Sarah's case, this, uh, her pimp and found her when she was an 11 year old girl walking home from school one day and he was driving by a Cadillac and offered to take her to get ice cream. And so Sarah got in the car with him and that began uh, the grooming process for her. And over the next several years between the ages of 11 and 13, uh, this pimp by the name of Gigi uh, raped, uh, abused, and uh, essentially developed a traumatic bond, allowed Sarah to develop this traumatic bond with him. <laughs> and he then exploited that when she was 13 years old and forced her into prostitution from the age of 13 to 16. At 16 years old, uh, she ran away from him for about a week. And with another adult male, uh, co-defendant uh, decided that she was going to, to go back and kill and rob him. And, and she did just that. 
And when she was arrested and uh, went through trial, uh, she very much was treated as as a, as a terrible perpetrator. She was sort of looked at as a, as a child monster who had killed, uh, you know, uh, almost kind of like killed an innocent man, uh, dare I say. Um, that's sort of how the justice system really treated her. And, and I say that because upon sentencing, uh, the judge actually said to Sarah in, in the transcript uh, that she lacked moral scruples. So here was a girl who, from the age of 11 to 13, had been raped and abused in uh, some of the most worst possible ways, and then from 13 to 16, had been uh, forced into prostitution by a violent girl pimp, and then she ran away from him, came back, and killed him. And uh, our response as a society, and what the judge said, was that she was the one that lacked moral scruples. And the judge then subsequently sentenced her to die in prison. And Sarah's case, and then Sarah and I sort of have this very unique um, friendship now because Sarah's case was one of the very first things that I worked on uh, when I was employed at my uh, former organization where Senator Sears and I first met, uh, which was at Polaris Project. And this was one of the very first things that came across my desk. And, uh, we we were asked uh, to get involved in her case as an organization and to support her efforts for clemency before Governor Schwarzenegger. And so I uh, spent uh, weeks pouring through uh, her case file that was provided by her pro bono attorneys at Perkins Coie, and we eventually did get involved and, and took an active role in, in trying to get Governor Schwarzenegger to commit her sentence. When she was released in October of 2013, um, you know, like many children who end up in the justice system and then come out, can't, can't come, come home. Um, you know, it was it was a very difficult scenario in which she was facing. And over time, her and I talked extensively about her experiences while incarcerated and, and what it was like for her as a child sex trafficking victim to have been incarcerated for, in my judgment, uh, was nothing short of essentially acting in self defense. Of course, in the law, there's this discrepancy because uh, there's a gap between uh, currently that exists, uh, where in most self-defense statutes, there needs to be this threat of imminent harm that a victim can prove in order to show that they were acting in true self-defense before um, they could they be protected from prosecution. Of course, that doesn't often apply in the cases that we're talking about involving child sex trafficking and sexual abuse victims, uh, because oftentimes their crimes against their perpetrators are premeditated. And so that brings me to, to the issue of Sarah's Law, and one of the things that we've been working on around the country. Uh, currently, there are three bills pending in, in states across the country. There's one in Hawaii, there's one in Nevada, and there's one in the state of Arkansas. And then later today, Congressman Bruce Westerman, who is a Republican from uh, Arkansas's Congressional Fourth District, will be introducing a federal version of this bill. And what Sarah's law does is it, it says that you know when a child sex trafficking victim or a child victim of sexual abuse uh, can show us by clear and convincing evidence that within one year prior to the commission of an offense that the person they committed their crime against had sexually abused or sex trafficked them, that the judge then has more options and is, and is empowered to depart from any mandatory minimum sentence, can suspend any portion of an otherwise applicable sentence, or can transfer the child back to the jurisdiction of the juvenile or family court for proper adjudication. And one of the things that we're really excited about is that this is a, you know, a cutting edge issue that many states have just begun to take up and that we're we'll really push down. Uh, because we believe that what happened to Sarah Cruz and what happened to Cintoy Brown, what has happened to the last part and too many young girls uh, and boys around the country uh, is nothing short of a human rights abuse. Uh, it is not an appropriate response 
when children lash out against people who sexually abuse or traffic or rape them, uh, to sentence them then to decades in prison. And so we're really, uh, really excited about this new uh, sort of law. Um, I'm happy to provide, and actually I think I did provide uh, Peggy within the committee with an issue brief and some other additional information for committee members to read up on a little bit. Um, Sarah has a couple of op-eds that have also been placed around the country in Nevada and Hawaii, where she uh, details her story and experiences a little bit more, and it really speaks uh, for, as a voice for uh, girls like her and Satoya who are uh, so often left out of these conversations that people aren't thinking about. Uh, but as the committee uh, takes in all of the uh, all of the information and testimony you hear today uh, and think about uh, additional ways that uh, Vermont can continue to, to work on these issues, um, I would highly, highly encourage uh, the committee to take a look at that. Um, James, we, we, have the, we have the commentary by Sarah, a copy of that. We also have, uh, should poor sex slave get a break or <coughs> death? That's the headline. And then we have your memo um, regarding uh, Sarah's law. So I'm uh, just talking with Michelle Childs from Legislative Council. We may actually have portions of what you're talking about, but um, we're going to try to look at what we have and how we can update. That's great. That's, that's great to hear. Uh, Thank, thank you so much for that, uh, Senator Sears, and um, yeah. I you mean, also I, had um, one of the new members, the, one of the, the only new member of the Judiciary Committee uh, is Senator Baruth from Chittenden County, and Senator Baruth is a chair of the Education Committee in the Senate, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about providing educational and awareness materials to local school divisions, including teachers, administrators, parents, and students on preventing human trafficking. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we have also been working on around the country, and we currently have uh, two different bills, one in Arkansas and one in, in Nevada that, that is pending. Um, and, and it's been modeled after previous legislation that I've worked on in the past with uh, survivor and advocate Holly Smith, actually. Uh, this was an issue that was really important for her. And that was uh, making sure that uh, we were doing our best uh, to focus on the prevention, prevention of trafficking in children and also empowering local school districts and sort of, you know, frontline uh, folks who come to contact with children regularly, the ability to be able to identify and spot the red flag indicators of, of human trafficking. And so against that backdrop, there, um, uh, the laws that we've worked on in this area specifically say that uh, the Department of Education in, consult in consultation, uh, usually with the Department of, of Human Services or, or Social Services, um, shall work on providing and developing and providing these educational awareness materials uh, to be provided to local school di uh, divisions. Um, and that those information should be available for distribution both to teachers and administrators as well as the parents and students. Uh, and they shall focus on efforts and strategies that have been proven effective uh, for the prevention of trafficking in children. And and I can actually get the, the direct language of some of those bills um, to uh, the committee um, if, that, if that would be helpful. I have yeah, to that, that would be helpful. helpful, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, that is so important in that particular legislation, I'll give you two great examples. Down in Georgia, uh, back in, I think it was 2012 or 2013. Now, they didn't do this through, through legislation, but um, they uh, had me come down there and do a comprehensive training uh, during in-service uh, teacher and administrative trainings. And I think, how oh, I forget, there was a large number, it was over a period of a week or so. Um, but they had all of their educators come in and learn about uh, human trafficking and sort of red flag indicators and those sorts of things. And then from that, they, uh, on their own initiative, uh, designed and developed a, uh, a contest among students where I think first prize got $1,000 or something, or $1,000 scholarship, I forget exactly what it was, but it was a, a contest uh, to have students design 
the best poster uh, to raise awareness about human trafficking and then also promote the National Human Trafficking Research Center hotline. And they award, I think it was a total of four prizes um, in the different uh, school districts throughout Georgia for the best posters that were designed both in English and in Spanish. And one of the great things about that is it was a great way to get kids educated and actively involved in helping to raise awareness amongst themselves and giving kids an agency uh, to be engaged in this topic as well. And then uh, the other example I wanted to share is, is when one of these bills was passed in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and this was a few years ago. And uh, I actually learned about this after I had, I had left the Laris Project, and uh, they had been looking to hire somebody um, to take over in one of their executive roles. And, uh, one of the, uh, there was a guy that they really wanted who was really talented, but sort of was outside of the, uh, the pay rate, I think, of, of what they were, what they could afford. And his, his little girl came home from school one day, and he was telling them about this, and uh, they shared with him that they had just learned all about human trafficking and uh, what to look out for, and that he really needed to, to go back and work at the organization, which I thought was a really cute story. So he ended up um, working there, um, in part because his girls had just uh, been uh, taught and educated about uh, human trafficking in school. And so, you know, I think a lot of focus over the years has been on the uh, prosecution side of, of human trafficking, and rightly so. Um, but I think this is a bill that really allows a state to begin to focus on actually preventing human trafficking from occurring with the most vulnerable population that we have, which is our students, and making sure that um, in those institutional settings that we are also equipped to be able to identify uh, victims when, when um, who might otherwise not be identified by teachers. And I'll, I'll give you another example of this. Um, the Grossmont School District out, out in San Diego, there was a pilot project that they launched several years back where, um, uh, I'm blanking her name, she used to work at the Department of Ed, but she developed a, uh, this program where they went into, you know, at-risk schools and they did what she termed these social autopsies where they would go in and get the case files of girls in the school that they knew had been system involved, you know, either because their you know, parents were going through a divorce or uh, because they had been uh, picked up from having been true or run away previously. So they got all this information, looked at these, these girls' files, identified girls that they felt were the most at risk for human trafficking, and then invited those girls, had them come during the school day, um, to a seminar to learn uh, more about red flag indicators of unhealthy relationships and talked about uh, what human traffickers do within that context. And in listening to the woman who, who pioneered this project, one of the things that was fascinating was that during the course of their discussion with these girls, they would talk about the different ways that pimps, you know, try to recruit and groom and brainwash young know, girls. And some of them, some of the girls in the class would sit there and say, wow, this is, uh, this is what sounds a lot like what this guy uh, I'm currently talking to is doing. And, you know, which was just a sort of a super helpful, I think, in, in, in potentially having prevented trafficking from occurring within those girls, but also a really big model that I think could, could be replicated as well. And it all goes back to, you know, having these sorts of, um, laws in place that really get the Department of Education administrators and teachers uh, who are on the front lines with students uh, directly involved in these efforts to, to prevent trafficking in children. So I will um, I will follow up with the committee and make sure that I get a, co a copy of a couple of those bills that have passed around that, the country. That would be very helpful. Yeah. That would be very helpful, James. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, is there, are there any questions for James at this point? James, I, I, we've got to run because we have what's called judicial retention in about five minutes. 
and it's uh, where Vermont, <coughs> the Vermont legislature gets to decide whether to retra re retain our judges. A certain group of judges be come before the legislature every year to decide whether they get retained or not. And it's an odd little duck, but that's something we do once a year. We're doing it this morning. So, hey, thanks so much. And Michelle may be in touch, or I'll be in touch, and uh, we'll keep in touch. And thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the committee. You all have a great day. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. Bye now. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, I think it's leading me in a couple of directions here, but <clears throat> really your jurisdiction in terms of training and how yeah, this interest is. I was but remembering. Maybe some of working with Chris, maybe there's some yeah. of that yeah. training that can be done without legislation that Absolutely. just would get us involved in schools and open to it. Mm -hmm. you know, it, could be, it could be just a word of legislative intent to have this happen. Yeah. I'm thinking Debbie Ingram had a bill the last two years. Is that right? Maybe it was two years ago. Anyway, to deal with a related issue, which is sexual exploitation at home or, or incest at home. And so it was a very simple bill that just said that school districts had to put up a poster in English and Spanish with a hotline number. And it was amazingly difficult to get the house to go along with it and also to get the <coughs> superintendents, <coughs> principals, because, well, they had a whole host of reasons why they didn't want to do it. Um, but so we wound up in the conference committee of the miscellaneous bill having to drop it because they put a real resistance to it. Uh, it may be better to go through just having it a voluntary thing in our school yeah. districts, but when I went through, what one of the surprises when I went through the jails in Vermont, every jail, and it's got to be five posters, everywhere you turn is a poster about the rape elimination project in jails and hotline numbers and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I just thought, I was surprised that they're at Vermont's effort, and I think it's a federal effort. Um, so there may be some work with the Center for Crime Victim Services and the network could do with local schools. I know in Bennington, the local network program does have a uh, school, a person who works with the schools directly who could do some of this on human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And we had an odd case in Bennington, not odd. The guy, a girl ran away from the Bennington school, which is just, you know, they're mostly from out of state, but they're like DCF placements. And the Bennington School Group Home, one of the kids ran away, and she ended up with this guy in North Bennington, who then, um, you know, she ended up having sex with three other guys in his apartment. And he got charged, and he was all upset about it, claiming that, you know, he had no idea she was under 18, and he called me, and I said, well, you know, why the hell were you even thinking about having sex with this girl? Whatever the reason, with three of you, that's pretty, you know, low down. And he said I didn't care about him anymore, and I, you know, he keeps calling my home and letting me know that you know, the only one that will help is Representative Morrissey, and I'm kind of wondering what he's married up for. Him. But um, <coughs> that wouldn't be sex trafficking necessarily, but it certainly was sexual exploitation. Mm -hmm. of that child who was on runaway. And, you know, I don't, if they hadn't caught him, I wonder what he might have done, you know, to end up in a trafficking situation. Mm -hmm. Yep, understood. So, we won't meet until 9.30 tomorrow morning. So